Hey, thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Jonathan Clark, also known as DJ Bolivia, and I'm working with Francis Cormier, uh, also known as Urban Francis. And welcome to part five, the final part of our series about uh, teaching you how to produce a progressive house track. And uh, basically, if you haven't seen the first four parts of this series, this video probably isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. You'll probably want to go back and start at the beginning. Uh, video one was a very general overview of the scope of the entire project and talked about some of the technical issues like the fact that we're using Ableton 9.5 for this version. Uh, anyway, that first video, yeah, very good broad overview explains what we're trying to accomplish. And then the subsequent videos, two, three, and four, in those we kind of delved more uh, specifically into the various instruments used in the track. So video two was all of the kick, video three was the bass, uh, piano stabs and guitar, video four, chords, melody, vocals, pads, and effects. And this one is going to wrap things up by talking about all of the send returns that we have set up. Uh, we'll go through those track by track, send by send, and uh, we'll also maybe go into the guitar section probably to talk about uh, illustrating how some of that is automated and how that all ties together. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about the master channel and some of the processing that we're doing on that, that you should do before you output your, your remix. Okay, so let's get right into it with the sends and returns. I'm going to go through each group and show how we use the sends on our group tracks and sometimes even on our individual tracks. Sometimes they are being automated and sometimes they're just, uh, we just have them turn to a certain level. So we're going to start off with the kick. I'm pretty sure that on the in instruments themselves, or the individual tracks, sorry, there is no um, sends being used. And that's true. So we're doing it on the group track for the kick. I'm going to I'm going to loop the kick. So it's soloed, and I'm going to let you listen to the two sends that we are using. In this case, we're using uh, send A, which is reverb, and uh, send F, which is uh, it's called New York compression. I'll open them up just to let you see what uh, is on them exactly. On the reverb, we have it uh, turned to 55%, and on the um, on the New York compression, we have a what we what it is it's it's it is compression, so it's compressing the kick. But the big thing is it's EQ'd, so in this case it's only the only the low of the kick, like only the lower everything below um, 700 hertz is being compressed. I'm going to demonstrate what it sounds like when it's not being on. Actually, I'm going to loop this. I'm not sure why the loop didn't keep playing there. Okay, now it is. So we're going to go to the reverb first. Turn And I guess with sends, is it, it, it is to taste. But a lot of times, you don't want to turn a send up too loud because you, you could the, the effect could really mess up the, 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 the overall sound. And um, In this case, it's reverb. You're going to hear it. Um, it's not going to be that much of a difference though, but so you always want to bring it up past where you want and then bring it back to a level that you feel sounds good. So now we can hear it really pumping through. So we brought it back to 10. It gives it a little bit of space, but you don't want too much. You probably want a lot more on your snare. I'm going to turn your speaker volume up just a bit. There. Okay. That should help. And then on the, on the New York compression, you can really mess up and put this too high, which will over compress the actual kick. So we have it at 25. I'm going to turn it off first. You're, you're going to hear a difference. Now I'm going to crank it past 25, and you're going to you're going to really hear it. But, it's, but now we've got it, now we got a problem though. Unless you're doing like a hard style, this isn't the sound that we're looking for from our kick. So we we found that around 25 is the perfect amount of compression. Next, I'm going to move on to the drums, solo the drums. Might go to a different section. It's a little more interesting, I guess. Okay, on the drums, I'm going to open up by uh, clicking here. You actually open up the sends that are on the actual group track. Uh, we're using, I think, New York compression again on the, on the snares. I'll demonstrate the sound. I'm going to go way above. Not really, be, not as bad sounding as the actual kick sounded not that loud, but it is. You are over. What you're doing is you're over compressing it, causes distortion. It doesn't sound good in your mix. 
gonna have to command Z to get, bring it back to where we headed. So it was at 26. On the individual, I'm gonna check the individual tracks too for the sends and returns. Nothing on snare clap one. Oh, we do have reverb on the second on the second snare. Um, I'm gonna have, it's gonna have to loop the green part, which is the second snare. And it is it's it's the same reverb that we used on the kick, but we're using it more extreme because on the snares you can get away with more reverb. I'm gonna turn it off. Put it up all the way. It sounds good with the snare up that way. With the kick, it's it's too much. So that's the drums group. Next, we're gonna go to the hi hats. I'm pretty sure it's just. I'm gonna close this for a second. R here is how you open up your your return. It is we call it send returns, and these are called the returns. But it's the R you click on that opens them up. On the hats, I'm pretty sure it's on the group. I could be wrong. Yeah, it is. It's on the group, and I don't think there's anything on the actual... Oh, we have an automation delay. Okay, so we're going to have to talk about that. So it's just on the... Um, it's on the group send, and it's on... It's on a, a delay is on this hi-hat. This is... Um, this, is we're do, this is a compression, too, and so this is called high compression. So what we have is... If you look at this EQA, it's EQ'd in only... Um, the top, uh, the top high frequencies being being heard. It's rolled off at 3.34. Everything under 3,340 hertz is rolled off, and it's actually I should turn the compressor off and on. You'll, you'll notice a big difference in the sound too. So it's that compressor that's really boosting the sound. And with our hats, without this, um, without using the send, it, it wasn't really pumping through. The, it wasn't really punching through the mix. Is probably the best way to call it. I'm going to. Um, I'm gonna let you hear it within the song, and I'm gonna move up. I'm gonna move the the, the, uh, the send up and down. And when I pull this out, it's you're gonna you're, you're, it's gonna really feel like it's fell out of the mix. Just disappeared completely. I'm pretty sure we had that cranked almost all the way up. Yeah. And actually, another quick thing I should do is this is an arrangement view. I'm gonna tab or and I'm gonna bring it back to to the uh, session view, and you can uh, manipulate your sends. In the session view, and you do this by you can see uh, an S and an R, R being the returns, which are the same as in the session view, and in in the um, and this is in the this is in the session view. That was in the arrangement view. Sorry. So in the session view, when I press sends, then they come they come here, and so these um, dials are the sends, uh, the, re the represented dials in the session view. But in the arrangement view, they're represented in these boxes. So going like that on, on send A is the same as going back to the session view and moving this. If you're not using them, it's good to close them. Gives you more room. Okay, so that's the hi-hats. So we're moving on to the bass. I'm not sure if we have sends on the individual bases or just the actual group. Right now it looks like it's just the group. I'm gonna ch it is just a group. And I'm guessing it's a it's a mid compressor. So in this case we're using um, G. No no sorry, we're using H. So I'm gonna click on H and as you can see the EQ8 it, it's a it's doing a band pass and it's rolling off the lows and it's rolling off the highs. And then I'm gonna show you this really helps punch the song into like the mid-range and the basses start to become uh, known. I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to bring it in and if you bring it's going to over compress it once I get up too high. So it really did change. I think we hit it at 20. I could try the other bass here too to see what it changes in this sound. We're doing it on the group, so it is doing the same to the bass we were just listening to and this bass. I'll take it in and out. It really gets, it's really a presence too that's missing when you take it out. So adding these sends is really important um, and using them to really complete your mix and make it sound professional. Without them, uh, it's not gonna, the sound isn't gonna, you're not gonna get this sound anyway. So that's the bass. Next, we're moving on to the bass two. 
I'm gonna have to find it and loop it. It's only in the intro and outro. I guess we'll loop it in the intro. And we, we actually did, we just did the identical thing to base two as we did to base one. We, we, we used the mid-range com compression on, this, on the send and we put it at 20. So it's the same idea. Really warps the sound when it's up that high. So usually with sends, you're not gonna be going up, up past minus 20 is actually pretty extreme on a send. Next we're on to the piano, which is at the end of the track. Loop it, solo it. And we're doing a, we're doing a high compression on this. So this is bringing out the high, and with piano, you, we are, the way we're EQ'd it and the way we're using it, we are trying to emphasize the highs. So it does make sense that we're using the high, the high compression on the send. I'll actually, I'll, do, I'll go through the other ones too, just to see what they sound like. Um, I'll turn off the one that we're using first. The New York compression is going to boost actually the highs and the lows, but there probably isn't any. It might do the same thing as what as the highs because there is no lows really in our piano. Oh, you can hear a little bit of lows there. Turn that off. Then we that's the one we use with the high compressor, and then there's the mid compression, which will bring out the, the mid sounds. It will actually kind of make this. It would probably make the overall mix muddier. So I think we picked the right the, uh, the right compression. Compress the highs. And bring it back. I'm not sure if it was, I think we had a 20. I have to do a couple of command Zs. Yep, 20. Next, we're going to the guitar. On the guitar, we're using a lot of the sends in the, both the group and in the individual tracks. On the group, we're using a washout. I can demonstrate that. And the washout effect is actually a combination delay reverb. And we only have, we have it automating in. Actually, it's probably easier to hear it uh, like that. Let it go past. Actually, you can, you can hear the tail end of the washout. On the actual guitar itself, we actually put on the, the guitar playing the chords. I'll loop that section of that. I shall loop it up here where this, it's the sound is actually all in because we had some auto filter going on. Uh, we have the mid compressor working on it, on the send. I'm gonna take it out. Pretty slight, but you did notice a difference. And that's just overkill. So we hit it at 18. The sends on the guitar lead, we have both automated sends and we're using sends uh, that aren't automated. The high, com the high compressor isn't being automated and we're, we're using it to uh, kind of help boost the sound through. As I turn it off, you're gonna hear the, well, you're gonna hear the sound come more into the mix. And we had it set at minus 30. We have, uh, on the, oh, I just actually turned the, it's a good thing, I just turned this off by, because I actually moved it a bit, so you have to right click and you have to go re-enable automation. And then it, once it turns red, that means it's actually, it's actually auto you're hearing the automation. So we have the washout effect, which is a delay reverb. I guess I'll go down and show you the washout. It's actually a Mac, we have it set up to a macro, and the macro is up to, it has a dry wet and it's up to 100%. And actually by having that macro up to 100%, we actually have the dry wet from the simple delay and we have the dry wet from the reverb both up to 100%. They're both assigned to the same macro. So uh, by change, it's through, through, it's through changing the, automating the actual, uh, send itself that is causing the, ch the uh, increase in the washout sound and we on the we have a, a delay on this send and this delay is is being automated now to the chords and and melody which we do have one delay on the actual group trying to find that it's actually here going into the break it's a dotted so it's, I'll just I'll play that the Group is solo, so you should hear. Should be able to hear it now. And it's putting a delay at the break into a before break is is pretty common to do that, in a, like in a lot of, of occasions. Now we're moving on to the the actual chords themselves. We do have some reverb on the chords. We have 
Uh, a wider, a wider is a simple delay. I'll go to it and show it to you. A wider, I think, is a simple delay. It is a simple delay, and this it, it actually increases the stereo field by having um, having the the time set at different milliseconds. You want one to be around between one and five, and the other one to be between, I guess, one and twenty-five. Also, we have a reverb to give it more space, and then there is an EQ eight on it, so that would mean that we have it boosted there at. Uh, on the, the five, it's boosted at 269. That means more of that frequency would actually be being would be being uh, wa um, reverbed or simple delayed. And the limiter is, I think, with the limiter off, I don't think the sound is even heard. I'll, so what do we have? What are we using for this? Wires on the chords. So I'm just going to loop that. Solo it. So the wider is on here, so I'm going to turn it up and turn it off. So you're getting a little bit more of a stereo spread. More sp that sounds really good. On the strings, we have more delay. And on the pluck, there is mid-range compression. We'll loop that and just show you, the, show you what that's doing. Probably bringing the sound making the sound more focused. So I'm going to turn it off. Yeah, big difference. That's overkill. Next, we're moving on to the pads. Okay, in the pads we have another, we're using the wider again. We're also using, I guess we're using the wider here twice, we probably shouldn't be doing that. Could turn the wider off on one of them. And we have a washout effect, and I think that's at the very end of the, we have that at the very end of the track, which it kind of creates a tail. I may as well let you hear it. Control L. Actually, I'm going to have to let, make that loop go like that so we can actually hear the, um, the washout. Might have to turn that up. So there's a washout, and it's... No, cut right out. No, I think that was, uh, I think that's faded out anyway. Okay. And so it's not, uh, it's not really affecting the track. Okay. Well, next we're on to the vocals. And I have no send returns happening on those. Okay. So there is no send returns on the vocals. And then there's the I effects. The effects, I'm not sure what's on this. There is no send returns on the effects. So that pretty much summarizes all of the sins and effects and effects for the whole track, then. Yep. Okay, so let's look at the master track, and in the master track, we do have um, we do have an audio effect track here. And if you've ever got an audio effect track and you don't want it, you can get rid of stuff. And all you have to do is go onto the effect track, right click, and then down here, ungroup and that rack disappears and all your individual components are still in place. So we could leave it like this if we want. Um, for the sake of consistency, I'll just put it back. Anyway, what we have here on our master track is uh, we have, starting off, we have the Sausage Fattener. Okay, so let's play, um, let's see, let's, let's take uh, some of the busy stuff, say the part B, and I will put the first uh, four, the first two sections of that on repeat. And we will play the whole thing. And so if the sausage fattener is off, you can hear that it loses a lot of its, uh, its guts. And you have to be careful with, with Sausage because I've only got that at 8% and you can really... See, that's just way too much distortion. So, you know, small amounts is good. And then the coloring um, up at the high end gives it a lot more trebly presence. Okay. 
so that's that's our sausage fattener. Now let's look at the EQ8 next. Turn that off. You're not going to hear a huge difference. I don't think you'll hear any difference. And basically what I've done here is I'm just rolling off a little bit of the overall highs and lows for the whole uh, track as a uh, the track as a whole. And then my limiter was in case I needed to, uh, in case I had any red lining sneaking through that I didn't realize that that would cut that uh, volume down temporarily and make sure that we're not peaking, we're not hitting zero decibels. And uh, then finally, for the reverb unit, it's at a very low amount. And I just have a generic reverb on here. I haven't really set it up for anything fancy. It's just a small amount of wet uh, to kind of give reverb to the track as a whole, and it kind of glues all the sounds together, I guess is the best way to explain it. It's really, um, it's really something that you would want to uh, learn more about in a mastering tutorial. You know, the, the difference between mixing and mastering, right now, this version of the track is an unmastered track. We have our mix straightened out, and so I have some effects on the master output track to try to sort of emulate a rough, quick and dirty mastering job. But if I was actually going to send this to a mastering house, then my preference would be to send it to a house where they have Ableton 9.5 and are comfortable with using it, because they're going to go into my project and they're going to play with it a little bit before they start playing with the master. What they might do is they may turn off the reverb on the master track, turn off the limiter, turn off the EQ, turn off the sausage fattener, and they may send that output. You know, it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot of uh, excitement there, but they may send that as an export out into a master wave file, and then they may take that wave file and run it through a whole bunch of their effects, which may be very similar to the ones that I'm using here, but probably slightly higher quality. And, you know, they've got the mastering people usually have a lot more skill at this and know where to, to study the, uh, they'll study the spectrum analyzer, for example. And so they'll be able to notice if there's slight uh, deficiencies or, or excesses of certain frequencies, all sorts of small tweaks that someone uh, like you or me would probably never notice. Okay, but since this one is not being mastered at the moment, I do have these effects here to try to give it some more, uh, some more oomph. So once more, let's turn these, uh, turn these four off and we'll let it play. I'll turn my speaker volume up a little here. I'll let it play and then I'll fairly quickly bring all four of these in and you'll see what the difference is. Okay, so for the purposes of this tutorial, this gives us a final output for our track that we're quite happy with. Now, as far as exporting, if you want to export your track, once you've, let's say that you've been playing with this and you've made a whole lot of changes and you're happy with uh, your, your final version that you're listening to right now, and you want to, uh, you want to make this, uh, send this out as a final, final WAV file. So let's downsize some of these groups and uh, get a better handle on what we can see on the screen for real estate. And so there's our whole project file. And if I were to highlight everything, well, the easiest way to do this often is to just hit Control A. And then everything's highlighted in every track for the entire length of it. Then I'm going to go up to File. I'm going to go Export Audio or Video. What I'm going to send out is the master track. It's going from bar one, position one. Yes, that's good. To 244 bars later. Okay, that's good. That's past the end of our... That should inc incorporate all of our delay tails and all of our reverb tails. I'm not going to do it as a loop. My file type, I'm going to do a wave. And if I was on an Apple, I might be using an AIFF. They're both uh, good, high-quality, uncompressed 
algorithms. Sample rate, 44, 100 is the same as a CD. That means the sound is being sampled 44,100 times per second, or hertz. Dip, bit depth of 16, that's good. You don't want to go any lower than that. If you are sending just your exported master track to a mastering house, I would recommend possibly going with a higher sample rate and possibly with a higher bit depth. If, if you have the capability to get it to them that way, um, that's not really an issue nowadays with faster internet and Dropbox and stuff like that compared to 10 years ago. You know, before people were kind of reluctant to go above 44.1 and above 16 bit because it was hard to send it through the internet. So you might have to send stuff by mail. But now, talk to your mastering house, and if they can't take the whole Ableton project, which I would think would not be the case, but for some reason, let's say they don't have Ableton, ask them if they want it at a higher sample rate than 44100 and at a higher bit depth than 16, because that may be the case. And then for the dither options, um, what are your thoughts on that, Fran? I know you only want to do it once, and that, like, and you would. I guess we're gonna do it at this stage. And the power the one that's set is the one I always use, and kind of the one I'm power I've heard, you yeah, been told. Yeah, that's the one to use. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good point that you don't want to do it twice. So you may want to save it as no dithering if you're sending a, an exported track out to a mastering house. But again, ask them what they want. And then once you have all that stuff set, you export. You pick your location where it's gonna go. Make sure it's got a good name. Hit save, and it's going to just take a couple minutes to render that and to save it on your uh, your hard drive. And then you've got your final wave version. And of course, you may want to convert it to MP3. You probably want to add ID tags into your MP3 file, and you can use different software to do that. Um, you may want to end a, add a, a video graphic into your MP3. That's something I always do, so I'll edit something with Photoshop first at a good high quality uh, graphic, put the name on it, put the artist name, put the track name, and I'll include that into the mp3 or into the WAV file before I start sharing it on the internet. Anyway, so that's basically, uh, that's a quick overview of what the master track involves in this specific project. Okay, now that we've gotten through the project, I want to mention a number of other things which aren't uh, necessarily related directly to this project, all of them, uh, but they should be pretty useful things for quite a few people that are learning to produce this kind of music. Okay, so the first thing is, um, there's many different ways to accomplish a lot of things. And what's a good example? Probably the automation. Uh, for example, we talked about the fact that you can automate tracks or you can automate clips. And sometimes, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, either approach will work equally well. In other areas, maybe maybe one way or the other is better, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. But it's not just automation that's like that. There's all kinds of things within music production where you can often take more than one uh, approach to get your, the, the final uh, result that you're looking for. Like, for example, if I was in Pro Tools and I was trying to time stretch tracks, there's really there's four different ways I can think of that you can do that, okay? So all, all kinds of different approaches sometimes. Um, now, as you're going through this project, don't be surprised if you find some minor mistakes. Uh, let me give you an example. This is something I noticed during filming that really bothered me, is that on this uh, strings track, right around here, I don't know what's going on there. I haven't actually stopped to look into it in any depth, but it kind of sounds like there's multiple delays happening at the same time, and they're kind of crisscrossing and causing a bit of havoc. So I guess the, the moral of the story is once you think you're finished a project, step away from it for a day or so if you can, and then come back to it with fresh ears and go through every single part of the project one line at a time and look for little problems like that. Because sometimes you'll hear things that you've been, you know, you've, you listen to them 150 times while you're building the track and never really notice that it doesn't quite work in the, in the project. So you sometimes have to step back to be able to see that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, stepping back, d don't ever be in a rush to put your, your tracks out. But at the same time, I also mentioned earlier, sometimes you do have to put your foot down and say, okay, I'm going to call this done, even though it's, you know, even though I could probably spend another 50 or 100 hours on it. 
Okay, the next thing to do is uh, talk about the fact that some of these tracks are empty. And, like for example, chords and melody track within the chords and melody group is empty. And you're probably wondering, why did we not just delete that? Well, let's go, let me fold that, and I'm going to tab over to session view. Now, looking at session view, you can see all these cross-hatched areas. And what this means is that underneath, on this row or scene, when you open the folder, expand the group folder, somewhere on that row within the folder, there is at least one clip and possibly more. Okay, so on this scene, the first row for scene, you can see there's actually four separate clips on different tracks. And so that's why that's lit up. And it takes the color of the, uh, the first one going left to right that it sees. Um, let's look at another one. Let's look at the hi-hats. Okay, expand that. And so you can see that these light up. It doesn't matter if there's one, two, three clips, whatever. It's only if there's no clips at all on that row that there's no uh, little symbol there to indicate there's something underneath. So going back to the chords and melody, if you look at that one track that looks empty here in arrangement view, if you look at it in session view, you can see there's clips on it that are useful. So there's all kinds of building blocks in here, um, some of which we did not even use in the project. And we thought, well, there's no point taking them out because a lot of them are not taking up much space at all in the project. And also, that'll give you something extra to play with. So, for example, you know, there's tons of MIDI clips here for the hi-hats. And so you can drag and drop some of these into the project and replace some of the stuff that we had to come up with different hi-hat patterns and stuff like that, if you don't want to build your own MIDI. Okay, and if you're not sure how to do that, very simple. You pick the click, pick the clip that you want to move into arrangement view. So let's say it's HH1, hi-hat one. You click on your left mouse button and keep it held down. Then press the tab key to go into arrangement view. Now, as you move the mouse cursor around, you haven't let go of the button yet. And so that clip is kind of stuck to your cursor. And as soon as you let go, it drops the clip onto the channel, onto the track right there. And you can see it there. Okay, so that's useful. Now, uh, the last thing that's really important to talk about is don't be surprised if you learn a few things uh, working with another producer. Fran said he learned some things from me. I certainly learned a few things from him. But it's interesting, some of them are so obvious that you know, there, there are a couple things I learned that I should have known years ago. And one of them relates to the groups. Now, we kind of referred to this earlier, and when Fran and I were talking about it, um, I don't think I even fully grasped what I was talking about at that point. Because, okay, imagine this. Imagine you have a session, and you have 12 tracks. Every single one of those individual tracks, these are normal tracks, not groups, um, each one of these tracks has volume automation on it, so it's going up and down and whatnot. And let's say that each of these individual tracks is not that loud in the mix. It's maybe negative eight, negative, negative 10 decibels, whatever. But the cumulative effect of them all playing together at once brings the volume up, brings the signal up, going to the master and out of the master, so it's too high. It's too hot. It's redlining, it's distorted, it's going above zero decibels. And so, well, obviously, you're going to have to back off, lower the volume on some of your channel faders to make this work. But if you've got all this volume automation all over the place, that makes things really tedious because you've got to do a lot of adjusting to bring stuff down. Well, if you have your tracks inside of groups and you don't have any volume automation on the group itself, then when you bring the volume of the group down, it brings everything within the group down relatively the same, or up relatively the same. Okay, so how is this useful? Okay, so imagine that same situation with 12 tracks full of automation. If all of a sudden those 12 tracks are inside 12 separate group folders, and each one of those group folders has no automation on the group, 
then you can raise or lower all of the volumes for the group rather than going into all the individual tracks. And especially if you get into a complicated project where, you know, say your hi-hat folder group has 17 different hi-hat tracks in it, then it would be extremely tedious to fix the volume on 17 individual tracks when you could just bring it down or up in that group. But here's what's really amazing. If you're in Ableton, and let's say I click on the clip on the kick to select that channel. Let's say I go over to effects, I'm going to hold down the shift key, and that has the effect of selecting all of them when I click on it. And once I have them all selected, let's just, uh, yeah, once I have these all selected, if I go and raise or lower the volume of any one of the channel faders, they are all going to raise and lower together as a group. And that is simply amazing because it, it'll only take you a few seconds. If, if your mix is starting to redline, it takes seconds to bring one of them down when they're all selected. They all come down equally. Everything stays with the same volumes relative to each other, even though the whole, the whole mix is coming down. I have no idea why I didn't know this or think about it before. Um, I'd like to think maybe it's because I learned on Ableton 7, and I don't think there were even group folders back in Ableton 7. And certainly I've used groups, uh, grouping in all kinds of other DAWs, but I just haven't really thought about it a whole lot in uh, Ableton. Now I have done some, some creative routing uh, with buses and stuff like that, which I think is why I never really got into the group thing. But trust me, use the group folders. They're really simple, really powerful. and. Let's say that you have a situation, okay, this could be tricky. Let's say you have a situation where you want to change all the volumes, with the, no, better example. You want to automate the volume of your group, but you still want the power of being able to do this little trick. Okay, so really what you need is a nested group, a group within a group, because on the first group that contains the tracks, then you could put your volume automation on that grouping and then you could have a parent group folder that has no automation that you do if you're doing this up and down all at once trick. Um, the only thing is, I don't think Ableton lets you group groups at the moment. And some DAWs do. Um, so I don't think Ableton does that yet. Uh, possibly they will in the future. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, also, there are ways around this. For example, um, let's say I wanted a snare and a hi-hat to be grouped within another group folder. Um, the way to do it, what I would do is I would set up a new individual audio track and on that audio track for the, um, for the audio from, change that to in because it's going to listen to my snare and my hi-hat. And then for my snare and my hi-hat tracks, the audio to, I would feed them to that audio track. So basically, it's kind of the traditional way that people, studio engineers, have done things for, for many years. It's just called routing, routing things within to a bus, okay? And you can do more research on the online. Anyway, groups, very, very powerful. Um, yeah, play with them. The other thing I want to talk about, a lot of you watching this series are probably interested in production, you've done some, uh, but you're still learning. We're all still learning. Um, but if you're at the point where you've watched this and a lot of this stuff was over your head, but you understood some parts and you're excited about this, you do plan to go back and watch some of these videos in the series again, you plan to play with this project, whatnot. I want you, um, if there's five things that I really recommend that you need to understand for dance music production, electronic music production, I'm going to list those five things right now. So consider this to be homework if you don't understand some of these. Okay, first of all, the frequency spectrum. Absolutely critical. Understand exactly how the whole frequency spectrum is laid out. What parts can the human ear usually hear? You know, from lows of, say, 20 hertz to highs of, say, 
20,000 hertz, maybe, for someone with really good hearing. Probably a lot less for someone who's, who's getting older or who's, uh, who's abused their hearing a little bit too much. Anyway, within that whole frequency spectrum, understand where each of your instruments sit. So, a kick, for example. A lot of kicks might have frequencies, the majority of their sonic energy would be, say, between 30 hertz and 100 hertz, or 30 hertz and 200 hertz, depending on the kick, stuff like that. Bass guitar, also low, a little bit higher than the kick. Maybe most of that's from, say, 80 hertz up to 400 hertz. Uh, sub bass, sub kick, those will be low again. Start going higher in the frequency spectrum, things like guitars, vocals, human voice, uh, keyboards. Those things may have a lot wider spread within the spectrum than just a kick drum. And they're also higher. Anyway, the whole point is, if you learn to understand what frequency range every instrument occupies, then you can start having a better sense of where things overlap and start muddying each other up. Because if you know where your voice and your guitarist and your keyboard sit, then you can figure out, well, what am I going to take out, rip out of, you know, which frequencies am I going to kind of carve out of each sound? Because if you do it right, then the sounds each have their own place, more or less, within the, uh, within the mix, and they'll stand out better. So frequency spectrum is really important. Just learn, learn to understand them. Uh, second thing, side chaining. And side chaining is mostly specific to this type of music production, dance music production. Uh, you won't see a whole lot of that. Uh, it, you'll never see side chaining if you're recording a vocalist and a fiddler. Um, but anyway, side chaining is a bit of a confusing topic for some people, and it's really just kind of come to the forefront in the last five or six years. Um, so that's your second topic. Third topic is your effects. Make sure you understand how the main different types of effects work. And so if I had to list the main ones, reverb is important. And there's several different types of reverb, um, you know, like plate reverb, convolution reverb, etc., etc. Delay would be the second big effect, echo. Uh, a third one would be your your time-based effects uh, and doubling stuff. So like phasing, uh, flangers, chorus, uh, vocal doubling is kind of related to that, although it's not an effect. And then your fourth uh, effect would be uh, filters. Um, and those are pretty related to equalization, EQs, which are related to your frequency spectrum. So there's going to be a little bit of interplay between some of these topics. Anyway, if you learn that stuff, reverbs, delays, chorus, flanger, phaser, filters, that's going to give you a pretty good idea of, uh, of how to do a lot of effects processing that'll uh, you know, bring some life into your track and some variety. Uh, the fourth thing that you want to learn about is uh, sends and returns versus inserts. Okay, so we covered send return tracks in this project. Did we cover inserts? No. Ah, but we did. Any, any of these effects that you're dropping onto a track directly, that's the same as an insert, even though we didn't really talk about it as such. So if you're looking at external material about audio mixers, about studio setup, stuff like that, and they're referring to inserts, think of it that way. Inserts is the stuff on the track. And what's the point? Why would you have a send return versus an insert? Well, send returns are useful if you have limited resources. And this can either be money and physical resources, or it could be processing, computer resources. So if I'm in a studio and I have a single reverb unit, or let's say I have a single compressor, an Alesis 3630, okay? That's all I can afford is one compressor. And I want to compress stuff on four different tracks. Well, I can't put that as an insert onto each of the four tracks at the same time. And it seems a little frivolous to have four separate compressors all working at once when you could put the one compressor onto a send return and then the signals all go through it simultaneously and then back out, okay? And the same thing applies to, to computer processing power. 
it's way better for your CPU load and for possibly drive space, memory allocation, all sorts of stuff. If you can have a reverb unit on a send return and all sorts of tracks are sharing it instead of dropping a reverb device onto each track. So signal routing, so critical in the audio world, in the studio world, and equally critical within computer-based projects, within DAWs. So learn that stuff. That's probably one of the most complicated things to understand for most people that are learning about this stuff. Um, it certainly was one of the more difficult things for me. And, you know, you'll learn about things like routing to buses, all sorts of stuff. Um, complex topic, just look into it. The more you understand about it, the better. And then finally, your fifth topic, your fifth little bit of homework to research would be uh, compression. Very, very critical stuff. Uh, and compression is another one that's really confusing to a lot of people. I did a, um, within one of the videos that I produced a couple years ago, the mixing and mastering of a DJ mix video. There's a section about 20 minutes or so where I try to explain compression in that. And I think I did a pretty good job because I had a lot of good emails and feedback about that. So I'm going to put a link to that right here. Check that out, but don't necessarily stop at that. Just make sure you totally understand how compression works, how the ratios work, how the um, makeup gain works. Understand how limiting works, you know, different types of limiting. What is brick wall limiting? Well, it's really just a high compression ratio, stuff like that. Okay. So those are your things to learn. Frequency spectrums, your effects, side chaining, send returns versus inserts, and compression. And if you get all those things figured out, then you're going to be just fine in learning how to do everything else with this kind of music production. That'll give you a really solid base to move forward. Okay, I think that's just about everything. I know this has been a rather ambitious and detailed project, and quite a few parts of it were probably over the heads of some of you, but this is a great way to learn, I hope, so hopefully you've benefited from it. If you have benefited from this at all, please, you could do us a huge favor and share links to these videos on some of the message boards that you use. If you're talking about production message boards like Gear Sluts, um, the Ableton message boards, anything at all like that. Um, because I kind of hate sharing things myself on those things, I, you know, self-promotion. I'd rather have it coming from people like you that are watching that find it useful and you can kind of explain what you liked about the, uh, the series. And, uh, you know, I'd really, uh, I'd really like to encourage you to use this project, first of all, to make some remixes of this track of ours. Like I said, appreciate if you please label them with our names, Bolivia and Urban Francis, Courage, and then put your remix name. But put those remixes anywhere at all that you want. Put them on your Facebook pages. Put them on your SoundCloud accounts. Um, if you want us to take a listen to any remixes that you've made, send us an email um, with a link to, to the version on SoundCloud or wherever you've put it up. Uh, our email addresses, I'll put them below on the screen fcormier27 at gmail.com and mine is djbolivia at gmail.com so yeah sharing would be uh, a huge benefit for us if you can help us with a bit of promotion that way now as far as the other projects go right now this is the only version of the project in ableton but in the coming weeks hoping to get some other versions online soon for some other daws and again you'll be able to find those in our dropbox account as we get them online and uh, hopefully those are useful to some of you and I think uh, for some of the other projects the, the videos will be a lot more simple because we're not going to go through the whole project again with each editor and do a film series I'll probably do one short half hour video for each other editor kind of just showing how I pieced it together because a lot of those will be mostly based on just stems rather than a full project like this if you're a professional producer and you're interested in doing some work with one of us, uh, Fran's probably the easier one to get hold of year round because I spend about nine months in the woods and I'm not available for most of that time. But if you want to talk to Fran uh, with some ideas about projects that you want to work on, or if you want to hire him for ghostwriting a track, or if you want to hire him 
for perhaps some one-on-one -on -one tutorials using things like Skype or Google Voice or online Hangouts and stuff like that, remote desktop. Um, certainly feel free to contact him that way. And uh, I think that's it for now. Keep tuned in to my YouTube channel and hopefully we'll have some more production projects together for you in the future. Thanks for watching.